Happy Sunday. I hope you're having a really good day or if you're in a different uh, time zone, a good evening and I trust that uh, you've had a great week. I just want to remind you again, if you would, it would be so helpful if you would share this with someone um, and uh, like it, whatever, and uh, just so more people can get the message. I, I do also want to say one more thing uh, before we begin. That I just really appreciate those of you who week after week have been following along with us as we study through James. And I trust that uh, just like it's been affecting me, it's also been affecting you that God's got some things that we need to do and we need to live in a little bit more practical, basic way as believers. So uh, I just trust that uh, you're getting something from this. And I do thank you again for those that listen. Could we just have a quick prayer and then we want to begin. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. And I just pray right now that your spirit would touch all those that would listen today and those that would listen during the week. I just pray that you would just, uh, uh, we would sense your presence and you would give me clarity of thought and speech as I would attempt, Lord, to bring your word today. And Lord, be with us as we have communion together at the end. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we started last week uh, another subject in our series, Guidebook for Jesus Followers. It was called The Will. And it seemed to go a little bit longer than I, than I thought because I was trying to keep for 20 minutes. So we, we are going to do the, the conclusion today. But what I would like to do is to just briefly uh, just recap what we did. I'm not going to preach last week's sermon, then this week's. I just want to briefly recap. But first of all, I want to read the text that we used last week that will continue on for today. It's in James chapter 4, by the way, verses 13 to 17 in the New Living Translation. Look here, you say, today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know? what your life will be like tomorrow. Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. What to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are becoming uh, boasting about your own plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Maybe you've been wondering why is James so tough on followers of Jesus? Like he seems to keep at it uh, right through this letter. Uh, and, uh, he, you know, like I, I just want to, I want to read something that kind of made me re understand a little bit better why. It was, it was said by George Whitfield way back when. Uh, he's gone now, of course, but he said this, the sins of the church are far more offensive to God than the sins of the nation. Why would he say that? Because God expects more out of us who know him, who say we follow him, than people who have no dealings with God, or they don't believe in God, or they don't follow the word of God. I know that this guidebook was written long ago, and it was written so that we can live the life that God intended for us on this earth. And if, if I ignore it, for me, I'll be the loser. Uh, we forget sometimes who we really belong to. Paul, another writer in the New Testament, said this, you do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Not a popular thought in today's society where we are belong to ourselves and we'll do just what we want. Not if you're a follower of Christ. You do what the Word of God says. Um, now, last week, we, I just want to just recap on just a little uh, what we covered. Uh, so we, we started off with this. What are we doing with the will, the will of God, of course? And I wanted to show you three options from the book of James. He said there's three ways you can deal with the will. Number one is we can live as if the will is not relevant. That, verse, or that word relevant means it's not appropriate for the time in which we live. I mean, we live in a modern age. It's 2020, of course. Uh, it's not appropriate for our period of time that we're going through now uh, or circumstances that we're going through now, COVID. And you know what happens when we believe something is not relevant? We ignore it. We don't, we don't, we don't think it's important at all. Uh, the second thing we dealt with is uh, option we have in dealing with the will is we can live in defiance to the will. And remember what the verse we read is that it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And that word defy means deliberately 
not doing what you know you're supposed to do. Now we want to, I, I know that seemed, a lot of it sounded a lot, a lot really negative, I suppose. Uh, I'm grateful. I am so grateful James didn't stop with all the stuff we do that robs us of God's blessing, God's flavor, favor on our lives. But he gives us something that the weakest among us can do. So here's the third and only option for those who call themselves followers of Jesus. Well, at least I said the only option. The only option if you want to live with the blessing of God upon your life and have peace in your heart continually. Number three, we can live in daily commitment to the will. That's in verse 15. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. We're saying with that statement, James was saying with that statement, there's someone stronger and smarter than me in charge, and I will do what he wants. I, I would call this a positive verb, which is really obedience. That's what it's all about. That's what uh, obedience is all about, doing positive things uh, to what you know. Verse 15 again, what you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. See, when we confess on, in our own, by our own will and choice that we, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and we accept the sacrifice Christ has paid for us, we have an obligation, and dare I say it, yes, an obligation to do his will. Because as Paul said, we are not our own anymore. We were bought with a great price. Someone said, when we seek to do God's will, then life begins to make sense. Do you know that if you live committed to doing God's will on a daily basis, you and yes, me, we are demonstrating how Jesus lived. Jesus said this in uh, John 4, 34. Here, here's what he said to his first followers. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and finishing the work that he sent me to do. I was interested to, to check into that uh, word nourishment. What does it really mean? Well, uh, the dictionary said that it means food or other substances that are necessary for growth, for health, and good condition. So following God's will is necessary for my personal growth. Following God's will is necessary for my, my own spiritual and physical health. Keeps me in good condition, keeps my relationships in good condition. This is crucial to everything James is saying in regarding to being an authentic follower of Jesus. And I stress that word authentic. We have many people today right across our uh, continent, North America, up and down, South and East, West and East, North and South, who say they're Christians, who say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but don't do what we're talking about in the last nine to 10 weeks. And Jesus said something about that, but I won't get into that. So when I say authentic, someone that's real, that's they're genuine. See, we are not here simply to build a house, a nice home, secure our retirement, and have whatever we want materially. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, our agendas change, our priorities change, or what happens, we confess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but we do whatever we want, and then, of course, there's we have a miserable, joyless life many times while we're here. Let me let, let me be really clear, because if someone's thinking now, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to have a nice home, there is not anything wrong with having a home and planning for your future, and if God wills that we live a long life on this planet. There's nothing against that in the Bible. Do you know, remember what Jesus said, and I think I might have read it last week, uh, about a rich guy. He was stinking rich, matter of fact, in Luke 12, 21. Uh, Jesus said this uh, about this guy. He said, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. What does that mean? It didn't stop there at all. Let me, let me continue. A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Because if you have a rich relationship with God and I have a rich relationship with God, you know what will happen? the direction we go with our finances and, and all the material things that we might have will be different than those who have no care about what God thinks. See, even a long life, though, on this earth, in this world, according to what we read uh, last week, it's only a fog. It's only a vapor in duration in comparison to eternity, which is forever. I was reading something about the early Christians that said that when they used to write letters to each other, they would finish off their letters with DV, 
like they would be saying, I'm going to start a business or I'm going to go visit aunt so-and-so or uncle so-and-so, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Uh, they would put down DV. That Those two words, two, two letters stand for two Latin words, Dio Valenti, which means God willing. Would it be such a hard thing for us to live like that? I'm not saying write DV on every text you send or, or message you send or Facebook post. I'm not saying that. But live like we're planning uh like we're planning everything according to God's will. And if God wills it, then we're going to do this that, or that. We're simply saying, I want to do what God wants me to do. And everything I do, I want the approval of God. One guy said, uh, I just heard this a few weeks ago, the presence of God will not always fix your problems, but it will clarify your perspective. In other words, everything is not just rosy just because you, you are saying, okay, God, I want your approval but it will change how you look at things. And boy, that's so, so important. So a great question is today for all of us who are followers of Christ or anyone that's listening today, what is the will of God for me? Could I say something to you? And I, some, some of you need to hear this very clearly. I needed to hear it very clearly many years ago, and now I make it part of my life. And here's what it is. The will of God will never violate the word of God. And he said again, the will of God will never violate the word of God. So if someone comes to you, I don't care what their title is. They can be a reverend. They can call themselves apostle or priest or father or mother, whatever they're, 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 they, they could be. You could respect them a lot. But if anything they tell you to do or advise you to do goes against the word of God, then you, you don't need to do it. Matter of fact, you shouldn't do it because the will of God will never violate the word of God. So let's, let's uh, take the time that remains, not going to be much longer, uh, to talk about three areas the will applies to. And this is one for yet that are not followers of Christ. The will for those who are not yet followers of Christ. I'm going to just read a lot of scripture and not make a lot of, a lot of comments on these. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord isn't really slow about his promise. Now that promise is the return of Christ. We're going to be talking about that in a couple of weeks. As some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He's talking to those who are not yet followers of Christ. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. A little while ago, uh, I read this quote from John Eldridge. Don't know if you know him or not. doesn't really matter. But here's what he said. Christ did not die for an idea. He died for a person. And that person is you. You that are listening to me right now, if you're sitting on your couch... Or maybe you could even be in your car just listening to the audio. I don't know. Christ died for you. Christ didn't die for any certain religion or denomination. He died for a person. He died for you. Secondly, the will of God for the will for every follower of Jesus. And this is more the general will that applicable to every believer of Christ. It doesn't matter where they live, what continent, whether they're in India, Pakistan, China, Canada, United States, wherever they live around the world. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, talking about the believers that he had written a letter to, he said, they even did more than we had hoped. For their first action, notice this, their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. In other words, they wanted God in charge of their lives. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, here's another thing for uh, the will of God for every follower of Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy. That word holy means set apart, being God's property. So, listen, so stay away from all sexual sin. Wow, that's a blow for today. Let me read it again. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, by the way. Another one in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16 says, always be joyful. That's tough. Never stop praying. Be thankful, notice the words, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Notice it doesn't say be thankful for all circumstances. I've had lots of circumstances that I wasn't very thankful for, and I wasn't disobedient to God because I wasn't thankful for them. But what he's saying is be thankful in spite of the circumstances. And then there's one from the Old Testament, Micah 6, 8. O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. Do what is right. And you don't find what is right 
through the horoscope, through the newspaper, through social media. It's through the Word of God, through the Bible. So He wants you to do what's right. He wants you to love mercy. Love mercy. That doesn't mean you agree with everything people do, but to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Then thirdly, the will for every follower of Jesus, specific will. Specific will. And you might say, oh, you know what, God, as long as I love God and I'm a Christian, it doesn't matter, really matter uh, what I do. Well, I think God specifically calls individuals to certain things. Some of them might be great. Some of them might be very public. Some of them might not be. But if you think about people in the Bible, I'll give you some biblical examples. Moses was called to lead the nation of Israel. Uh, Joshua was called to lead them into the promised land. A woman named Esther became the queen. And through some, I'm not going to go through that story, but uh, her, she was uh, asked to do something uh, for to save her people from being killed. And her uncle, and she was, she was hesitant. She was afraid. And her uncle said, you may have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And maybe that could be you today in your family with your friends right now. Then there was Jonah, of course. He was a reluctant person doing the will of God. First of all, he didn't do it, but then he did, but he's still reluctant. Then there was Peter. Then there was Paul who talked constantly about the will of God for him. And he wrote this in Ephesians 5. Don't act thoughtlessly. In other words, don't live, go through life without thinking. Don't under, but understand what God wants you to do. Understand what God wants you to do. And then in Romans 12, 2, this is a familiar verse for those who, who uh, consistently read the word. You know this one, Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you, that's a process, into a new person by changing the way you think. That's a process. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, is pleasing, and is perfect. Hear that? The will for you, God's will for you, is good, it's pleasing, and it's perfect. And sometimes you find out some of these things, the specific will, by trial and error. Sometimes you think you should do something, you try it, and, and that's not what you should be doing. Then you, you know, God might show you a different direction. You might take a different direction to that. And you find that in Scripture sometimes they want to do something, then realize, no, that's not what they sh should be doing. I, I, along these lines, I, I, I was reading a story about some tourists we were in a place called the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. I've never been there, okay? But I looked it up just to make sure it was a real place and somebody wasn't fooling with me. And apparently in these caves, there's 400 miles of explored caves and more than that, unexplored. So they were all together, these tourists, and the guy decided to turn off the lights. He said, stay together. They stayed together. And he turned off the lights and it was pitch black. It was, I think, it was, uh, the way it sounded like it was so dark you could hardly see your hand in front of me. You know that kind of darkness you can almost feel? But someone said, who was there, he said, the, the guide, our guide really preached a five-word sermon. And here's what he said when the dark, was, they were in darkness. Stay close to your guide. Stay close to your guide. Wow, isn't that good for someone to hear today? Stay close to your guide. God. Here is the best route to sincerely and humbly follow, realizing that we do mess up sometimes. It's in Psalm 37, 5. Commit everything. You know what everything means. Everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Now, of course, there's common sense in there. You don't need to Lord ask what the Lord's will is if you should brush your teeth or should have a shower once in a while. That's not what it's talking about. It's about those things of life that, that could trouble you or you have to make decisions. Commit it to the Lord, and he will help you. So what is the best thing we can do about the will? James was absolutely clear. This is not something we should ignore. If so, we've already chosen one of those three options. We've chosen that the will is not relevant and we defy it. And there can be that, you know, that, that, that intonation to do that. And, and uh, a guy named A.W. Tozer said this, and the reason why sometimes we do that, he said, because a man is born, or a person is born a rebel. They are unaware that they are one. So their constant assertion of their self, as far as they think of it all, at all, appears to them as a perfectly normal thing. So it's it, it, because of the, who we are and, and, and our, our 
creation and the fall, all that, we think of ourselves all the time, it seems normal. And when that's not the way God wants us to be. So I would encourage everyone listening today, in regards to living it, what God, God desires for his creation, let's not be rebels. Life is so much better living in the will, his will. Take it one day at a time. Don't look 15 years down the road unless that's what God shows you. Take it one day at a time. Now, I want to conclude before we have communion together. So if you haven't got your communion elements together, get them together. We'll, we'll participate together. I want to do one excerpt. It's about 10 lines uh, of a little thing I read from what I consider, at least in my lifetime, the greatest gospel speaker and writer that's ever been since I've been. He's gone now. But his name was Billy Graham. Some of you have heard of him. Here's what he said. To know the will of God is the highest of all wisdom. Living in the center of God's will puts the stamp of true sincerity upon our service to God. You can be miserable with much if you're out of his will, but you can have peace in your heart with little if you're in the will of God. You can be happy during suffering if you're in God's will. You can be calm and at peace during persecution as long as you're in the will of God. The Bible reveals that God has a plan for every life and that if we live in constant fellowship with him, he will lead us in the fulfillment of his plan. End of quote. And when you lose sight, as someone said, with, 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 of the character of God, that he's good and he loves you, then it's so easy to be hopeless, to feel hopeless, and to have fear in your life. We're going to have communion together right now. And if you have your communion elements ready, um, I want you to prepare. Uh, could I just say a couple words? I, I'm not going to be long. We're almost done. Uh, I always think about the group that sat around the table with Jesus, the last supper he had before his death. A group much like us. Let, let me just tell you who was in the group. I, I won't tell their names, but there was one who was a doubter. He had his doubts about things. So do you sometimes. You found that if you read the Bible and the Gospels, you'll find out who he was. There were some who, um, they, they would not even defend Jesus when he was going to be arrested wrongfully. Matter of fact, they got full of fear and ran away. We've had fear sometimes. Um, we had, there was one who denied him and was afraid himself. There was uh, one who even made some extra money out of turning Jesus in and like betraying Jesus. So there was a lot of, these, these sat around the table, but Jesus still shared what was called then the Passover, the communion time with them. And Jesus told his first followers that he says, I want you to do this for a reason. I want you to remember what I've done for you. I want you to remember me. And I want you to continue doing this until I return. So today, as you take your cracker or bread with you, I want you to remember what Jesus did to those motley group that sat around with him that day. He broke the bread. He distributed it to those that were with him, just like I did with my wife. And he said, this bread, he said, represents my broken body. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Could we eat together and thank God for what he's done? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. For that person that's wa uh, watching right now who's taking part in this communion, I just pray they'll sense your presence. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And it says also that Jesus took the cup of grape juice, wine, and he looked around at his disciples and he said this, and I'm paraphrasing, this represents my blood. This is my blood, which was shed for you. In other words, you'll find salvation through trusting in my shed blood. And he said, drink this. And when you do, remember me and, remember, and make sure you do this until I return. Let us drink together and thank God for dying for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What I want to do uh, right now is pray, and then I want to give just a, a blessing from the Word of God uh, to you before we dismiss. I just want to say one more thing. For those of you who say, well, I, I kind of, you know, I know, I know what God wants, and, and I, I, I heard this, and I hadn't even planned on uh, sharing this, uh, but I had written it down. 
Be careful about stamping what you want on God's plan or how you figure it should go. Because if you try to do that, as a follower of Christ, it will bring frustration, it will bring fear and hopelessness. Rely on God to show you what he wants you to do day by day. And some of the things we already read. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for all those that are listening, those that have been part of this teaching today. I pray, dear God, that the Holy Spirit would touch people's lives today. I pray that somehow that if we call the word seed, the seed that I've just thrown out there with no assumptions, just to say what the word says and to explain, uh, Lord, I would spoke to me, that, Lord, it would make a difference in someone's life today. Maybe it's a follower of Christ who's been going a little bit their own way and saying, oh, what's, what's the big deal? And as, ah, all that stuff is not real relevant. Maybe it'll bring them back on course and align themselves with you and the, your word. Maybe it's that one is not yet a follower of Christ who once or who once was. And today they say, you know, I need to get back to where I should be with a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray they'll give their lives to you today. Lord, we just need your help in these, ta in these times. The Lord, there's they're, they're confusing times. They're frustrating times. They're, there's time, they're, they're, they are times of hypocrisy going on all through our country and around the world. Help us, Lord, to stay steady. May people that can look to us as followers of Christ and see some steadiness. We don't have all the answers when it comes to what's going on, but we know who we can trust, and we trust in you, Jesus. So, Lord, bless each one that's watching today. We ask in your name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace this week. If you've given your heart to the Lord this week, why don't you somehow maybe put it in the chat or message us and let us know so we can be praying for you. God bless you. You have a really, really good week.